Smith, a Pasadena resident, went shopping. She is 30 and has lived at 3037 North Foothill Street since 1992. Sarah has been married to John for seven years. They have two children. Bob is five years old and Nancy is three. Sarah owns a 1995 four-door blue Toyota. At 9 a.m., Sarah got into her car and drove to Bargett, a department store a mile away. Bargett was having a holiday sale. Sarah bought a four-slice toaster for $29.95 plus tax. The regular price was $39.95. She paid by check. On her way home, Sarah stopped at Milk Plus to buy a gallon of non-fat milk. The milk was $3.50. Sarah got 50 cents back in change. Sarah arrived home at 10 a.m. John and the kids were still sleeping. She woke them up and then made a hot and nutritious breakfast for everyone. A 79-year-old man was slightly injured on Saturday while waiting in his brand new convertible in a drive through lane at Burger Prince restaurant. Herman Sherman of Northville suffered a mild burn about 9 p.m. when a young female employee accidentally spilled a cup of coffee into his lap. Sherman said the coffee was hot but not scalding. He refused medical aid saying the only problem was the stain on his slacks, but it would wash out. He was given a fresh refill. Before Sherman drove off, the restaurant manager, John Johnson, gave him two free gift certificates, one for an extra large coffee and one for the restaurant's newest sandwich, the McWrap. The employee, who was a new hire, was let go later that evening. She was quite upset. She said she would probably sue Burger Prince for letting her go. She said it was the man's fault for ordering something that she might be able to spill. Six consecutive days of spring rain had created a raging river running by Nancy Brown's farm. As she tried to herd her cows to higher ground, she slipped and hit her head on a fallen tree trunk. The fall knocked her out for a moment or two. When she came to, Lizzie, one of her oldest and favorite cows, was licking her face. The water was rising. Nancy got up and began walking slowly with Lizzie. The water was now waist high. Nancy's pace got slower and slower. Finally, all she could do was to throw her arm around Lizzie's neck and try to hang on. About 10 minutes later, Lizzie managed to successfully pull herself and Nancy out of the raging water and onto a bit of high land, a small island now in the middle of acres of white water. Even though it was about noon, the sky was so dark and the rain and lightning so bad that it took rescuers another two hours to discover Nancy. A helicopter lowered a paramedic who attached Nancy to a life support hoist. They raised her into the helicopter and took her to the school gym where the Red Cross had set up an emergency shelter. When the flood subsided two days later, Nancy immediately went back to the island. Lizzie was gone. She was one of 19 cows that Nancy lost. I owe my life to her, said Nancy, sobbingly. A 15-year-old boy was injured in a car accident when the minivan he was traveling in was hit by a pickup truck at an intersection. The boy was taken to a nearby hospital. The paramedic said that it appeared that the boy had nothing more serious than a broken left leg, but that internal injuries were always a possibility. The boy was conscious and alert. His mother, who was driving, was uninjured. She said that the truck appeared out of nowhere and she thought she was going to die. She turned the steering wheel sharply to the left and the truck hit her minivan on the passenger side. The driver of the truck was a 50-year-old man who was unemployed and apparently had been drinking. Police found 18 empty beer cans inside the truck. The man denied drinking, but he failed the police test for sobriety. When asked to touch his nose with his arms outstretched and eyes closed, he was unable to touch any part of his head. The handcuffed man asked the police if they knew where Mabel was as he was put into the back seat of the police vehicle. The police asked him if Mabel was his wife. He said, she's my dog, my dog, where's my baby? 
A dog with a collar but no identification was found minutes later, half a block away. The man was taken to the city jail and booked on suspicion of driving while intoxicated and on causing an accident. Jerry Baldwin was 30 years old. He was the manager of a pizza restaurant. He lived in an apartment about one mile north of the restaurant. He walked to and from work. When it was raining, he took the bus. Jerry loved gangster movies. When a new one came out, he would go to the theater and watch the new movie three or four times. Then, when it went to video, Jerry would buy the video at Barney's Video Store. Jerry had a home collection of over 1,000 gangster videos. Old ones, new ones, color, black and white, English, Spanish, Japanese, he loved them all. He could tell you the name of the movie, the director, the stars, and the plot. Did you say you liked Pulp Fiction? Well, Jerry would rattle off all the details of that movie, and then he would invite you to his place to watch it sometime. He was a nice guy. Jerry finally decided that he would like to own a gun, just like the gangsters. So he saved his money for a couple of years. Then he went to a gun store and bought a used 38 caliber revolver for $300. While there, he also bought a couple of boxes of ammunition. The following Saturday morning, when he went to the gun club to practice with his new revolver, he was in the club for only 10 minutes when he accidentally dropped his pistol. The gun went off and the bullet went into Jerry's right knee. Jerry now walks with a limp and a cane, just like some gangsters. A 24-year-old Los Angeles man was taken to a hospital and then to county jail after leading police on a one-hour freeway chase in a stolen SUV. The chase ended in downtown Los Angeles in front of the Spring Hotel. Most of the chase was uneventful, except for an empty bottle of whiskey that the driver threw at one police vehicle. When the driver got into downtown, things started to happen. He ran over a fire hydrant. The water spewed out of the hydrant, causing a geyser that ruined all of the books in several carts that a vendor had put outside to attract customers into his bookstore. The driver hurriedly turned west on Grand Avenue and managed to bang into three parked cars on one side of that street and two cars on the other side. The driver also tried to run over a police officer who was standing in the crosswalk ordering him to halt. Turning north, the driver caused a bus to slam on its brakes to avoid a collision. The bus was empty and the bus driver was uninjured. However, two police cars that were pursuing the SUV from different directions were not so lucky. One of them ran into the front of the bus and the other into the back. Because the drivers had braked early enough, the damage to their cars was minor. Both officers resumed the chase. They only went two blocks north to find that the SUV had come to a full stop because it had plowed into a newspaper. They only went two blocks north to find that the SUV had come to a full stop because it had plowed into a newspaper stand. The driver, who was not wearing a seatbelt, was slumped behind the steering wheel. The proprietor of the newsstand was yelling at the driver and shaking a magazine at him. The police called for the ambulance. They charged the driver with failure to yield to a police officer and driving under the influence. Sam, an unemployed piano tuner, said it was only the second thing he had ever won in his life. The first thing was an Afghan blanket at a church raffle when he was 25 years old. But this was much bigger. It was $120,000. He had won the Big Cube, a state lottery game. To win, a contestant must first guess which number a spinning cube will stop on. The cube has six numbers on it. 1x, 10x, 50x, 100x, 500x, and 1000x. If he is correct, the contestant must then guess which of two selected variables is going to be greater. So, just guessing which number appears on the cube does not guarantee that you will win any money. Sam correctly guessed 1000x. 
but he still had to choose between two variables. One variable was the number of cars that would run the stop sign at Hill Street and Lake Avenue in six hours. The other variable was the number of times that a teenage boy would change TV channels in a three hour period. This was a tough decision. Finally, Sam flipped a coin. It came up heads, so Sam picked the teenager. He picked right. The stop sign was run only 76 times, but the teen clicked 120 times. 60-year-old Sam jumped for joy, for he had just won 1,000 times 120, or $120,000. Sam dreamily left the lottery studio talking excitedly on his cell phone while crossing the street. He got hit by a little sports car. Sam is slowly getting better. He was in the hospital for a month. His hospital bill was $110,000. And the insurance company for the little sports car's owner sued Sam for $9,000 worth of repairs. Also, Sam still has to pay federal taxes on his winnings. Sam doesn't play the state lottery anymore. He says it's better to be unlucky. Inmates released two correctional officers they had held for a week in the tower at the state prison complex. The inmates captured the officers a week ago after the two officers tried to quell a food fight in the main dining room. The food fight erupted when the prisoners discovered that their candy ration had been cut in half. The candy is a popular bartering item. Inmates trade it for cigarettes, cigars, magazines, stationery, legal dictionaries, and other items. Prison officials said it was necessary to cut back on this luxury item in order to provide basic items like soap and razors and toilet paper. The prisoners went berserk over the reduction. They threw food, plates, and silverware at the doors, windows, and guards. Then they grabbed two guards and hauled them up to the tower. Once they had the tower door secured, they sent messages to prison officials demanding big bags of candy in exchange for sparing the guards' lives. The warden complied with their demands. After a week of negotiations, the prisoners approved a deal which restored their candy ration but in return, the administration said they would have to reduce daily soap allotments by 75%. Two mayors made a bet on the outcome of the Vegetable Bowl, the annual football game between their high school teams. If Arvada's team lost, the mayor of Arvada would send the mayor of Boulder 10 pounds of sliced potatoes ready for frying. If Boulder's team lost, the mayor would send 10 pounds of sliced tomatoes ready for sandwiches or salads. Unfortunately, before the game started, the mayor of Boulder overheard the Arvada mayor tell someone, they grow the worst tomatoes. If they lose and send us their tomatoes, I'm going to give them all to my pig. The mayor of Boulder was upset to hear this because he thought Boulder's tomatoes were the best in the state so he gave the matter some thought. The following week, the big game was played. Boulder lost its star quarterback in the first half when he tripped over a cheerleader and sprained his big toe. The quarterback glumly watched the rest of the game from the bench. His team ended up losing 38 to 12. The two mayors shook hands after the game and the Arvada mayor said, I'm really looking forward to those tomatoes. As the Boulder team left the stadium, some unhappy fans threw ripe tomatoes at them. A week later, the mayor of Arvada received a package of beautifully sliced tomatoes. He took them straight to his pig, which gobbled them right up. That night, the mayor of Boulder asked his wife if Arvada's mayor had called. No, she said, why? because I mixed a pint of hot sauce into the tomatoes and I wanted to know how his pig's doing. Goats are being hired to do the work of men in a neighborhood just outside of San Diego. The fires that occurred in Hillboro four years ago destroyed 30 homes, most of which have been rebuilt. While contractors were rebuilding the homes, nature was regrowing the grasses, bushes, and shrubs. 
The area is now so overgrown in brush that it again poses a major fire hazard. The city council asked for bids to remove the brush. The lowest bid they received was $50,000, and that was if the city provided breakfast and lunch for the work crews for the six weeks it would take to clear the overgrown area. The city countered offering unlimited coffee, black only, and a donut a day for each crew member. When that offer was rejected, the city asked for help on its website. A sheep herder in Montana and a goat herder in San Bernardino read about the city's plight while surfing the web on their laptops. They both offered to do the job for $25,000. The council chose the goat herder because he lived closer. When told that the city dump was overflowing, the goat herder said, no problem, my goats will eat everything in your dump, except for the automobile engines, of course. So for another $5,000, the city killed two birds with one stone. If all goes well, they will invite the goat herder and his family back every three years. The goat herder said he will probably visit San Diego while his goats are in the dump. I want to take one of those hang glider rides. I just hope we don't crash. My goats would miss me a lot, he said. The owner of a missing cat is asking for help. My baby has been missing for over a month now and I want him back so badly, said Mrs. Brown, a 56-year-old woman. Mrs. Brown lives by herself in a trailer park near Clovis. She said that Clyde, her seven-year-old cat, didn't come home for dinner more than a month ago. The next morning, he didn't appear for breakfast either. After Clyde missed an extra special lunch, she called the police. When the policeman asked her to describe Clyde, she told him that Clyde had beautiful green eyes, had all his teeth but was missing half of his left ear, and was seven years old and completely white. She then told the officer that Clyde was about a foot high. A bell went off. Is Clyde your child or your pet? The officer suspiciously asked. Well, he's my cat, of course, Mrs. Brown replied. Lady, you're supposed to report missing persons, not missing cats, said the irritated policeman. Well, who can I report this to, she asked. You can't. You have to ask around your neighborhood or put up flyers, replied the officer. Mrs. Brown figured that a billboard would work a lot better than an 8 by 11 piece of paper on a telephone pole. There was an empty billboard at the end of her street just off the interstate highway. The billboard had a phone number on it. She called that number and they told her they could blow up a picture of Clyde from Mrs. Brown's family album and put it on the billboard for all to see. But how can people see it when they whiz by on the interstate, she asked. Oh, don't worry, ma'am. They only whiz by between 2 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. The rest of the day, the interstate is so full of commuters that no one moves. They told her it would cost only $3,000 a month. So she took most of the money out of her savings account and rented the billboard for a month. The month has passed, but Clyde has not appeared. Because she has almost no money in savings, Mrs. Brown called the local newspaper to see if anyone could help her rent the billboard for just one more month. She is waiting, but so far, no one has stepped forward. A man accused of failing to return more than 700 children's books to five different libraries in the county was released from jail yesterday after a book publisher agreed to post his bond of $1,000. The publisher said, there's a story here. This is a man who loves books. He just can't let go of them. He hasn't stolen a single book. So what's the crime? We think that Mr. Baruch has a story to tell. We plan to publish his story. When asked why he didn't return the books, Mr. Baruch said, Well, how could I? They became family to me. I was afraid to return them because I knew that kids or dogs would get hold of these books and chew them up, throw them around, rip the pages, spill soda on them, get jam and jelly on them, and drown them in the toilet. He continued, books are people too. They talk to you, they take care of you, 
and they enrich you with wisdom and humor and love. A book is my guest in my home. How could I kick it out? I repaired torn pages. I dusted them with a soft, clean cloth. I turned their pages so they could breathe and get some fresh air. Every week I reorganized them on their shelves so they could meet new friends. My books were happy books. You could tell just by looking at them. Now they're all back in the library, on the lower shelves, on the floors, at the mercy of all those runny-nosed kids. I can hear them calling me. I need to rescue them. Excuse me, I have to go now. The 36-year-old bachelor ate his usual lunch at home. He had an apple, a ham sandwich with a sliced dill pickle, a bowl of chicken noodle soup with a couple of soda crackers, and a small candy bar, all washed down with an eight ounce glass of milk. After he finished breakfast, Ed put everything in the sink, poured a little dishwashing soap onto a Teflon pad, and scrubbed the soup bowl, the sandwich plate, and the milk glass. Then he switched on the garbage disposal to grind up the few bits of food that he had scraped off his plate. He left the kitchen to go brush his teeth, but he felt something wet on his bare foot. Sure enough, he looked down and saw some water on the kitchen carpet. What is this? He said aloud. Opening the cabinet door under the sink, he saw no dripping water. He went to the closet and got a flashlight. When he shined the light into the cabinet under the sink, he saw drops of water on the sides of the dark blue steel cylinder. It looked like he had a leaky garbage disposal. To test his theory, he turned on the switch and a stream of water flowed out of a seam onto the cabinet floor and then onto the kitchen carpet. Ed had a problem, but he didn't have time to fix it now. He had to run some errands. He put some tape over the switch so he couldn't accidentally turn the disposal on again. Ed came home from his errands and put the groceries into the cupboard and the refrigerator. He grabbed a flathead screwdriver and a pair of pliers from his toolbox. In the kitchen, he got down on his hands and knees and turned on the flashlight. After a couple of minutes of looking, he decided what to do. He had never opened up a disposal before, but there is a first time for everything. The cylindrical disposal was about seven inches in diameter and had a horizontal seam dividing the top half from the bottom half. The halves were held together by three screws. Ed jiggled the bottom half of the disposal. It was loose because two of the three screws were corroded. Only one screw was still doing its duty. Ed unscrewed it. The bottom half of the disposal was now lying on the cabinet floor. Ed thought for sure that it would be full of months old food, but there was no food, only a hardened, torn, useless gasket. The next day, Ed went to the hardware store to buy some screws and a new gasket. The employee told him that they did not carry those gaskets and suggested that he write to the manufacturer. Ed returned home. He created his own gasket by using gasket sealant that comes in a tube. He applied the sealant, screwed the two halves back together, and crossed his fingers. The next day he turned on the water and switched on the disposal. When he saw the water pouring out of the seam, Ed knew one thing. It was time to buy a new disposal. The good thing was that new disposals start at $79. The bad thing was that it would have to be installed by a plumber. Plumber rates start at about $80 an hour. Ed decided that since the disposal used a lot of energy and the world needed to use less energy, from now on, he would put his scraps into the kitchen garbage bag. He reminded himself to tell everyone at work tomorrow about how he was now helping to solve the world's energy problems. An elderly woman told the police that as she entered a restroom, she was jostled by a woman behind her. A few minutes later, as she was about to pay for a mustache remover at a nearby store, 
she discovered that her wallet was missing from her purse. Apparently, the woman who had bumped into her had cleverly stolen her wallet. This type of theft is called pickpocketing. Perhaps an even more personal kind of theft is known as housebreaking or burglary. After such an intrusion, the victims often report a feeling of violation. They seldom regain the comfort and security level they used to have in their home. They constantly feel like they are being watched. They feel that if they go out, the burglars will again come in. They feel uncomfortable when they are home, and they feel uncomfortable when they aren't home. Burglars get lucky or make their own luck. Sometimes homeowners forget to lock all their windows or doors. Sometimes burglars will break a window, cut through a screen door, or force open a side door. Thieves have no shame. They will steal from anyone that they think is vulnerable. Of course, that means the elderly are their frequent victims. Some thieves are very clever. Some are very lucky. All of them make an honest person's life more difficult. It's too bad that all of them can't be caught and converted into honest people. Imagine that, a world with no larceny, a world where you can park your bicycle unsecured on the sidewalk or leave your purse unattended in your shopping cart. Is this only a dream? Some say that if you can dream about it, it can happen. Easter Sunday was a cloudy but festive day in Memorial Park for about 100 kids from local orphanages. An Easter egg hunt started at 10 a.m. when a fire engine blasted its horn. Boys and girls ranging in age from 2 to 6 dashed throughout the park, yelling and screaming, walking and running, and quite often falling down. One little girl, Amanda, found her first egg less than a minute after the horn blew. Instead of putting it into her basket and continuing to search for more, she sat down. Then she spent the next 10 minutes examining it, unwrapping it, and eating it piece by piece. When she finished, she put the wrapper into her basket, wiped her hands on her white dress, and went to hunt for another egg. Meanwhile, Jeff, one of the older boys, filled his basket to overflowing. He asked one of the firemen to hold it for him and then took off running for more candy eggs. As soon as he found some, he put them into the basket of the child closest to him. Two little toddlers both saw a candy egg at the same time and they both bent over to pick it up. They banged heads and both of them sat down, bawling. A couple of volunteer nurses picked them up and told them that everything was going to be all right. By 11 a.m., the search was over. Most of the kids were studying their candy, exchanging it with others, or eating it. But then the fire engine horn blasted again, causing three-year-old Jenny to cry. A fireman on a bullhorn told everyone to gather around because a special guest had arrived. Once everyone was settled, the Easter Bunny climbed down out of the fire engine. The bunny was six foot six inches tall. Most of the kids cheered and ran toward him. Even Jenny stopped crying for a moment. She stared at the bunny and at all the kids running toward the bunny. Then she started crying even harder. The Easter Bunny hugged the kids, and they hugged him. Then the Easter Bunny sat on a fire engine step, and one by one the kids came up, sat on his lap, and got their pictures taken. After that, the older kids were allowed to explore the fire engine itself. The festivities ended about 3 p.m. when the orphans climbed into the buses for the return trip home. Most of them said they had a fun time. Six-year-old Sarah asked, can we do this every Sunday? And more than one boy asked, can I drive the fire engine next time? Theodore, the manager of the Paradise Hotel, told a middle-aged couple that they would have to leave the hotel after just one night. 
The couple, visiting from Texas, had booked a room for eight nights. They wanted a sterile environment, Theodore said. They should have rented a room in a hospital, maybe an operating room. This hotel is clean, but it isn't that clean. Theodore said that on the very first day, the couple brought all the sheets, pillowcases, and bedspreads down to the main lobby and just dropped them next to the front desk. They stood there next to this pile of bedding while other guests looked, pointed, and murmured. The hotel got three cancellations within the hour from people who witnessed this strange event. When Theodore asked the couple what the problem was, they said that their bedding was filthy and they wanted it replaced. The couple could not identify any specific filth on the bedding. The wife just said, We're paying good money to stay here. How dare you doubt us? We know the filth is there. That's all the proof you need. Theodore called room service and the bedding was replaced immediately. Early the next evening, however, the couple marched to the front desk again and demanded seven cans of spray disinfectant. We need a can for each night. We have to spray the phone, the TV, all the door handles, the toilet handle, the shower stall, the faucet, the sink, and any hotel staff entering our room. Worried about what their demands might be in the following days, Theodore politely suggested that a hotel more suitable for them was just around the corner. He then called ahead to reserve a very clean room and gave them free transportation in the hotel limousine. They seemed surprised that I suggested a different hotel, but they liked the idea that I didn't charge them for the second day and they really liked the limousine service, said Theodore. The well-dressed, gray-haired woman was crying her eyes out. She had just been fined $100 by the judge because a month ago, her dog made a mess on the front lawn of the courthouse. I just got out of the cab and I leashed Poopsie to the light pole. After I paid the fare and gave the driver a dollar tip, I turned around and saw that Poopsie had made a mess. I didn't have any plastic bags, so I said, well, Poopsie, let's go home. There's nothing I can do about this now. We were just starting home when I heard this voice out of nowhere. Excuse me, ma'am, is that your dog? I turned around. It was an officer of the law. Well, of course it was my dog. That dog just made an illegal deposit on the courthouse lawn. As its owner, it's your responsibility to dispose of that deposit. See the sign over there? I'm going to have to write you a citation. I asked him what sign he was talking about. He pointed all the way down to the end of the block. One little sign a block away. How could anyone see that? I couldn't see that sign with my best opera glasses. The officer said that I could fight the ticket. He said the judge was a nice old man who owned four dogs. So I said, okay, thank you, I'll fight the ticket. So when I went to court, I dressed Poopsie up in his prettiest ribbons and made extra sure he did his business first. We were both so excited. I just knew the judge and Poopsie would hit it off. But do you know what happened when we got inside? They had a different judge, a judge who was allergic to dogs, and he immediately started sniffling, coughing, sneezing, and looking around. And then he yelled at me to get the dog out of the courtroom. He fined me $100 on the way out without even giving me a chance to talk about Poopsie's chronic dyspepsia. It was terrible. I'm still upset. A local community college professor decided to fight back. The price of books for our students is just getting higher and higher and combined with the rising cost of tuition, it's killing these kids, said Peter Jason, PhD. Remember, students are one of the poorest groups of people in America. Almost half of them have at least one part-time job. In fact, one of my students has three jobs. She is a part-time sales clerk at a clothing store three days a week, then works three evenings a week as a pizza cook, and on weekends she does manicures at a beauty salon. 
and she still manages to have a high GPA and go to school full time. Textbook prices are traditionally high. Adding to that problem, many college instructors change textbooks year after year. They either upgrade to a new edition or switch to an entirely different textbook. This further hurts students because if an instructor no longer uses a particular textbook, that book has no resale value. Dr. Jason decided to make life a little easier and a lot cheaper for his students by writing his own book on public speaking. Many books have an increased price because of bells and whistles, CD-ROMs, lots of color photographs, and lots of graphics. I talk to my students, and many of them, like me, prefer to keep things simple. So, during a sabbatical a few years ago, I wrote my own textbook. I made sure that it wasn't long-winded. I called it successful public speaking: how to be brief, concise, and to the point. Compared to most other public speaking primers, mine is half the number of pages and one third the price. That is thirty dollars instead of ninety dollars. Plus, it is published in a three-ring binder format. So, when I wrote a second edition last year, students only had to buy the thirty-five new pages and delete thirty-five of the original pages. For only seven dollars, they had upgraded to the new edition. I've had great feedback from my students about this loose-leaf concept. Maybe the word will get out, and more writers and publishers will try it. A man and a woman died in an apparent murder-suicide last night in Altadena. The man was 74-year-old Dominic Vittorio. The woman was his 70-year-old wife, Victoria. The couple had been married for 50 years. In fact, their 50th anniversary occurred just a month ago, according to their next-door neighbor, Mrs. Allen. The couple was childless and had no close friends. Mr. Vittorio was a retired carpenter who had emphysema and was blind in one eye because of a cataract. His wife was a diabetic who had already had one foot amputated because of complications from the disease. Her eyesight was almost completely gone. They were such a nice couple," said Mrs. Allen. "I've lived next to them for the last twenty years or so." I'm widowed, and Dom always used to help me with things like changing light bulbs and fixing appliances. They had no kids, but they were always friendly to the neighborhood kids. Every Halloween, they handed out tons of candy and fresh fruit. But about eight years ago, Vicky came down with diabetes, and things just haven't been the same for her or Dom. They used to be so friendly and full of life, and then they just seemed to get quieter and quieter. She used to come over to my place once or twice a week, and we would talk about all kinds of things and have the nicest time. But that happened less and less as she got sicker. So I would go over to her house about once a week, and we would talk. But the conversation steadily got shorter, and she seemed to lose interest in listening and in talking. She didn't say it, but you could tell she was in a lot of pain. Mrs. Allen said she hadn't even talked to either of the Vittorios in almost a year. They never came out. Even food was delivered to them by a local agency. She said she heard two gunshots last night. It scared me half to death. She immediately called the police. Such a sad ending for such a nice couple, she said. Together in sickness, but alone in the world. The city of Armada opened its arms to a new business on Huntington Drive at First Street. The store, called Turtle Dove, is a pet shop specializing in two kinds of animals. The owners are two brothers, Bill and Bob Pidkin. They moved here from the Northern California town of Santa Rosa, where they owned an ant farm store called Antimal House. That store was such a success. After five years, they sold it for a big profit. They took it easy for a couple of years, traveling throughout the states. We visited almost every zoo in the country, partly because we love animals, and partly because we were looking for inspiration for our next business," said Bill. They finally decided on turtles and doves. 
They are easy to feed and care for, and both animals live a long time, said Bob. The store will be open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Wednesdays through Saturdays. We think those are hours that our customers will find very convenient. Plus, the three days off gives us a chance to go into the woods and find more critters. We never buy our animals. We always try to collect them from the wild. That way we can pass on huge savings to our customers. And, of course, by removing these animals from their natural habitat, we protect them from being devoured by their natural enemies. So, our customers are happy, our animals are happy, and we're happy. It's a win-win for all of us. The mayor of Sacrapinto, J.K. Choi, 35, was charged with hit-and-run driving last night by the town sheriff. A freshly killed calf was discovered lying in the middle of Arlington Drive at about 10 p.m. A witness, 20-year-old Emily Parker, said she saw the car hit the calf and keep going. She didn't see the driver, but she did recognize the hood ornament on the car, a pair of bullhorns. Oh yes, Emily said, I know that's the mayor's car. It's the only car in town with bullhorns on the hood. Asked how she could see the bullhorns at night, she replied, Oh, didn't you know? A couple of months ago, the mayor had... Ah. Oh, didn't you know? A couple of months ago, the mayor got his horns neonized, so they have this soft purple glow at night. They're really cool looking. The sheriff drove over to the mayor's house, which is about five miles from City Hall, and found the mayor washing his 1972 Cadillac. He asked why the mayor was washing his car so late at night. Because that's when there's no hot sun that causes the car to dry so fast that you have sun streaks. Don't you know anything, Sheriff? The sheriff pointed out that one of the horns was broken at the tip. When did that happen? He asked. When did what happen? Choi asked. Oh, good grief. I never even noticed that. Do you know how expensive these horns are? They don't grow on trees, you know. I wonder if I can find the missing piece and super glue it back on. The sheriff then showed the mayor the tip of a bullhorn. Do you think this is the missing piece? The mayor was astounded. He looked at it, turned it over in his hands, and then placed it on the horn where it fit perfectly. That's fantastic, sheriff. Thank you so much. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? It was next to Farmer Brown's calf that you killed back there about an hour ago. The mayor's mouth dropped open. Calf? What calf? What are you talking about? I had no idea. I thought I hit a speed bump. What was his calf doing out in the middle of the road in the middle of the night? We'll settle this in court. I'm an innocent man. By the way, Get that calf over to Lester's butcher shop right now. We'll have us a big barbecue tomorrow at City Hall. And don't forget to invite Farmer Brown. I know he'll forgive me after he tastes Lester's world famous ribeye. Residents of Southern California are trying to get used to skyrocketing prices for gasoline. The average price for 87 octane economy gas is $2.22 almost 30% higher today than it was 12 months ago. The lowest gas price in the Southland right now is $2.09 a gallon at the Seashell Station in Arcadia. The station manager Everett said the reason his gas is cheaper than elsewhere is that he bought a lot of gas two years ago at reduced prices, so he is passing his savings on to his customers. The lines at the Seashell Station often run 10 to 20 vehicles long. The police have been here several times because cars block traffic on Horse Trail Drive. Everett said, I tell people in line that the Barco Station a block away is only 214, but they'd rather wait and save five cents. It's okay with me, of course. I don't mind making money. A young man pumping gas said he had waited in line for 20 minutes. When asked why he didn't go a block away where there were no lines, he said, Every penny counts. When I bought this 99 bummer, gas was only a dollar a gallon, which was pretty cheap. 
So even though I only get eight miles per gallon, I wasn't paying that much to fill my tank. But today's prices are killing me. I drive to work and I drive to the grocery store. That's it. I used to drive around the neighborhood just to show off my wheels, but I can't do that anymore. People joke that no one in Los Angeles reads. Everyone watches TV, rents videos, or goes to the movies. The most popular reading material is comic books, movie magazines, and TV guides. City libraries have only 10% of the traffic that car washes have. But how do you explain this? An annual book festival in West Los Angeles is sold out year after year. People wait half an hour for a parking space to become available. This outdoor festival, sponsored by a newspaper, occurs every April for one weekend. This year's attendance was estimated at 70,000 on Saturday and 75,000 on Sunday. The festival featured 280 exhibitors. There were about 90 talks given by authors, with an audience question and answer period following each talk. Autograph seekers sought out more than 150 authors. A food court sold all kinds of popular and ethnic foods, from American hamburgers to Hawaiian shave ice drinks. Except for a $7 parking fee, the festival was free. Even so, some people avoided the food court prices by sneaking in their own sandwiches and drinks. People came from all over California. One couple drove down from San Francisco. This is our sixth year here now. We love it, said the husband. It's just fantastic to be in the great outdoors, to be among so many books and authors, and to get some very good deals, too. The idea for the festival occurred years ago, but nobody knew if it would succeed. Although book festivals were already popular in other U.S. cities, would Los Angeles residents embrace one? Angelinos are very unpredictable, said one of the festival founders. Home buyers nationwide are watching housing prices go up, up, and up. How high can they go, is the question on everyone's lips. As long as interest rates stay around 5%, there's no telling, remarked one realtor in Santa Monica, California. It's crazy, said Tim, who is looking for a house near the beach. In 1993, I bought my first place, a two-bedroom condominium in Venice for $70,000. My friends thought then that I was overpaying. Five years later, I had to move. I sold it for $230,000, which was a nice profit. Last year, while visiting friends here, I saw in the local paper that the exact same condo was for sale for $510,000. It is a seller's market. Home buyers feel like they have to offer at least 10% more than the asking price. Donna, a new owner of a one-bedroom condo in Venice Beach, said, That's what I did. I told the owner that whatever anyone offers you, I'll give you $20,000 more, under the table, so you don't have to pay your realtor any of it. I was tired of looking. Tim says he hopes he doesn't get that desperate. Whether you decide to buy or decide not to buy, you still feel like you made the wrong decision. If you buy, you feel like you overpaid. If you don't buy, you want to kick yourself for passing up a great opportunity. Everyone says the bubble has to burst sometime, but everyone hopes it will burst the day after they sell their house. Even government officials have no idea what the future will bring. All we can say is that inevitably, these things go in cycles, said the state director of housing. What goes up must come down. But as we all know, housing prices always stay up a little higher than they go down. So you can't lose over the long run. 20 years down the road, your house is always worth more than you paid for it. Samantha, like many renters, is tired of renting. One reason is that her annual rent goes up like clockwork. Every year, her landlord raises the rent 5%. Another reason is her neighbors. New neighbors always seem to be more inconsiderate than the ones who moved out, she said. My first neighbor was a door slammer. I always knew when he came home or left home. 
After he moved out, a saxophonist moved in. A saxophonist. He practiced two hours a day. On Saturday, his friends would come over and I'd get to listen to a whole band. I called the police, but they said saxophone playing is permitted in apartments for up to four hours a day because saxophone playing is job related. They told me I was lucky that the guy was only playing two hours a day. There are many unhappy renters, but there are also happy renters. I've been lucky my whole life, said Howard, a middle-aged man. My neighbors couldn't have been any better if I had picked them myself. One neighbor was a chef. He'd bring me the best leftovers in the world. Another neighbor was a pianist. She played the most delightful music. Another neighbor was a mechanic who did my tune-ups and changed the oil in my car. My latest neighbor is a birder. We go birding every weekend with our binoculars. Different persons have different attitudes. Samantha saw the saxophone player as irritating, yet Howard saw the piano player as delightful. Millions of people would be happy just to have a roof over their head. Yet there are millions who would complain that their roof is the wrong color. A work crew consisting of 150 volunteers worked for eight hours in a light drizzle on Saturday to clean Carson Creek of almost nine tons of debris. A job well done, smiled Alan Spector, the director of the event. We're scheduled to come back here one more time three years from now. Of course, we hope that there won't be nine tons of garbage next time. The garbage came in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Cans, bottles, bicycles, car tires, auto batteries, sofas, furniture, clothing, shopping carts, bowling balls, plastic bags, dolls, baby carriages, TV antennas, and portable radios. There was even a golf bag with a full set of golf clubs. Much of the backbreaking work was done by two community groups, the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, and two environmental groups, Save the Bay and Watch the Whales. Concerned retirees and volunteers from police and fire departments assisted. Everyone was issued boots, gloves, and rain gear. The work occurred along a two-mile stretch of stream bed. The debris was hauled roadside where trucks lined up to take the trash to the landfill. More than 500 big yellow trash trucks were filled. No one found anything of great value, although a five-year-old boy found an earring that he thought might be worth a million dollars because it was so shiny. He said he would sell it. Then he would donate half of the proceeds to watch the whales and use the other half to buy a triple scoop ice cream cone every day for the rest of his life. A company in Phoenix, Arizona says that it can now clone your cat. Actually, said Felix Lee, president of Twice Is Nice Incorporated, you don't even have to wait until your beloved cat dies. We already have clients whose clone lives with its donor. The price is steep. A clone of your cat will cost $50,000. First, your veterinarian must do a biopsy of your cat. This is sent to Twin Incorporated, where it is cultured to grow fresh new cells. These new cells are stored in liquid nitrogen until you notify Twin Incorporated that you are ready for the clone. At this time, you pay half the amount, $25,000. A cultured cell is implanted into a female cat that is in estrus, and if it all goes well, a kitten is born about 60 days later. The new kitten is weaned in about eight weeks. Twin Incorporated delivers the kitten to you after it receives the remaining $25,000. We are a growing company, said Lee. Our facility can handle about a dozen births a year now, but our goal is to produce about 50 kittens and 50 puppies a year. The company is currently experimenting with stray dogs. Some canine clones seem to be perfect, but some have been bizarre. Nevertheless, Lee believes that they will be successful cloning dogs in about a year. The Oceanside community of Lozano Beach is debating whether to allow homeowners to rent out their homes on a weekly basis during the summer. Such rentals produce high incomes for the owners 
and the city, which gets part of this income through a 15% surcharge to the owner. This can be a boon to our coffers, said Rick Brown, city manager. In the summer, homeowners can bring in $2,000 a week or more. However, these rentals can also be a can of worms. The city stopped allowing weekly rentals 10 years ago because of the problems they were generating. Two, three, or even four families would pile into a two or three bedroom house. Then they would park their cars on the lawn and produce huge amounts of trash. Sometimes they would toss this trash on the streets and sidewalks. Noise would be another problem. Some people would party late and loud every night. This abuse created a lot of friction with neighbors and resulted in extra work for city maintenance crews and for police who had to respond almost hourly to residents' complaints about noise, music, trash, and parking problems. But now the city's budget problems are making it reconsider its ban. City officials will hold a community meeting next week to listen to the pros and cons. One official has already suggested a proposal. He thinks that a fine might work. If the city has to respond to complaints, the homeowner will be charged $200 per response. Such a fine might cause the homeowner to be careful to rent only to people that he is sure will be considerate of the neighbors. The city would still get 15% of the rental fee, even if the homeowner's rent were totally offset by fines. The city would post inconsiderate renters' names on the city website so that other homeowners would know about them. Some officials think the ban should be continued because these visitors to the community have already proven that they have no consideration for others. Their money isn't worth the headaches they cause. The mountain town of Canton is at an elevation of 6,000 feet. It is surrounded by thick underbrush and pine trees. Because of six years of drought, these plants are a major fire hazard. Thousands of trees and tons of underbrush are going to be removed over the next five years at a minimum cost of $3 million. The brush will be removed first, then the trees will be toppled and removed. A cleared, non-flammable area will then safely surround the town of 4,000. Residents look forward to the work because it will help their town survive a future inferno. But there are two problems, said one resident. All the extra trucks are going to make traffic pretty bad. Once the area is cleared, we have to make sure dirt bikers don't try to make the cleared area their personal playground. A recent fire burned 4,000 acres and destroyed 11 homes in nearby Hamilton. The fire was raging toward Canton, but a sudden rainstorm put it out. Residents know that they won't get lucky twice, so they are looking forward to this massive clearing operation. 90% of the cutting and clearing will be paid with federal funds. Unfortunately, if the trees are on private property, they must be paid for by the residents themselves. Prices can range as high as $1,000 to cut and remove one tree. Officials say that residents can apply for state and federal loans if necessary. Well, what good does that do me? asked Thelma, a 65-year-old widow. I'm living on Social Security. I've got four trees on my property. The government's not going to loan me money when they know there's no way I can pay it back. So what am I supposed to do? These planners, with all their big ideas, ought to think of the little people. A man convicted of writing bad checks to casinos has written a book that he predicts will become a national bestseller. Entitled A Casino is Born Every Minute, the 250-page book details James Duncan's successful and unsuccessful attempts to beat casinos. Duncan is serving a five-year sentence for grand larceny in the Las Vegas city jail. He wrote 18 bogus checks ranging in value from $3,000 to $10,000 at 17 different casinos. My only mistake was cashing that last check at the same casino I had cashed the first check at, said Duncan. They were waiting for me.
Duncan only has a few months left before he is released from the jail. During his incarceration, he used the library facilities and computers to write his book. He completed the book two months ago and is now shopping it around to various publishers. Books about gambling and casinos are very popular. People like to read about gangsters, beautiful women, flashy cars, posh hotels, and the exciting possibilities of winning it all and losing it all. Duncan says he was the first card counter in Las Vegas. He claims that he made almost $1 million at blackjack. Then other card sharks started copying his technique. They abused the system, said Duncan. They got greedy. If they'd been like me and just won some here and there, different places, and different nights, the casinos wouldn't have gotten suspicious so fast. When the casinos realized what was going on, they started using two or more decks at the blackjack tables to thwart the counters. They escorted out anyone they suspected of counting cards. The Sealess Lake Park reopens today after being closed for six months. The park was closed because mud and rock slides destroyed part of Cambridge Road, the only access into the park. We had to remove tons of boulders and rocks, said Hugh Foster of the Parks and Recreation Department. Then we had to rebuild a bridge and reconstruct almost a mile of highway. I'm really surprised we got it done so soon. The park is three miles north of Colfax on Highway 28. Cambridge Road is a two-lane highway that winds upward through Pearl Canyon before it descends to Sealess Lake, which has about 20 miles of shoreline. The largest lake in the county, it is also famous for bass. In fact, the record largemouth bass catch in California occurred here in 1975. A 14-year-old boy caught a 19-pound bass. The lake has two ramps for boaters, a full-service restaurant, a snack bar, a small tackle store, and a boat rental facility. As with all county parks, no alcohol is sold or permitted. More than 100 picnic tables have protective roofs and big barbecue pits. There are public restrooms with free shower facilities, lots of trash cans, and hiking trails for nature lovers. The west side of the park includes a softball field, a soccer field, and two volleyball courts. Horseshoes and kite flying are two other popular activities. In the summer, a designated swimming area has a lifeguard on duty seven days a week. The entry fee is $10 per vehicle and $10 per boat. Reservations are not accepted. The parking lot holds about 500 vehicles. If it is full, no additional vehicles are allowed to enter. Latecomers either leave or wait in line for someone to leave the parking lot. Some weekends there are three dozen vehicles waiting in line outside the gate. Because of many requests, park officials soon might start permitting campers to stay overnight on weekends. The park is open from dawn to 10 p.m. during the summer. We probably average 2,000 people here every day during the summer, said Foster. They come here to fish, swim, water ski, jet ski, picnic, commune with Mother Nature, you name it. People love this place. Summer is almost here, which means it is time to sign your kids up for swim classes again at the community pool. Classes begin on Monday, May 1st, and will continue throughout the summer. 15 swim classes are being offered. Each class lasts 10 hours. A new class starts each week of the summer. Each class costs $20. The pool is big enough for six students per class. Classes will increase in difficulty each week. The first week is for children up to six years old. The last week is for advanced swimmers who want to improve their race and endurance skills. Students can sign up for as many classes as they like, but they must pass the skills level test. For example, students who sign up for level four stroke readiness must show their certificate for completing level three or must demonstrate the front crawl and backstroke. Children cannot sign up for a level they are not ready for. 
Children who have never attended community pool classes must show up April 29th or 30th for a swim skills evaluation. Instructors will rate the students and assign them to a particular skill level. Swim classes are fun for all. Children learn new skills and make new friends. Parents get to meet other parents in the community. Swimming, like bicycling, is a healthy and valuable skill that once learned is never forgotten. It's a joy to teach young children, said Ginger, the lead instructor for swimming programs. More than half of them are terrified when we put them into the water the first time. Two months later, they're begging their parents to go to the pool every day. All seniors 55 and older are invited to a special meeting next Tuesday in the Senior Center. The meeting will begin with cookies and lemonade. The speaker will be James Carter, the director of a nonprofit organization dedicated to making the golden years fun and interesting. We have too many seniors who act old because they think they're old, said Carter. Our goal is to help seniors realize that they're as young and active as they want to be. Getting older does not mean sitting around waiting to die. It means getting out and doing all the things you never had time to do while you were working and raising a family. Carter will identify the services and activities that are available to seniors locally and statewide. Included are legal aid, tax advice, discounts for bus and taxi travel in the city, and free blood pressure testing on the first Monday of each month. Testing for diabetes and for cataracts is offered four times a year for a nominal fee. The city also provides inexpensive dinners called Meals on Wheels. Volunteers deliver these meals to seniors who are homebound because of illness or injury. An internet class begins this month for seniors who want to visit the World Wide Web. Many seniors still use typewriters, said Carter. They see no need for a computer, but after they take this course, some of them may decide to buy their own laptops. New activities at the Senior Center include bingo on Friday and Saturday nights with a grand prize of $50 each night. The center is also offering strength training classes. As you get older, said Carter, you need to keep both your mind and your body active. An active mind helps prevent Alzheimer's and an active body helps prevent osteoporosis. The Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development has awarded $5 million to three different local nonprofit organizations. The money will be distributed over a four-year period and is aimed at helping approximately 1,000 homeless people in the county of Arvada. One agency, with headquarters in Woodbridge, is slated to receive $1.5 million. The agency director says that they will focus their resources on educating the homeless. We will probably build another school home with this money, he said. A school home is exactly what it sounds like. It is a school and a home. We have already built four school homes throughout the county. We get the homeless off the street and we educate them so they don't have to return to the street. We teach them how to be auto mechanics, plumbers, landscapers, painters, carpenters, bricklayers, electricians, and air conditioning repairmen. You wouldn't believe the success that we have had. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, our office air conditioning went out. My secretary called a repairman. The repairman was one of our first homeless students. He now owns his own air conditioning business, plus two houses, two cars, and a boat. He has a dozen employees. Holy cow! He's been doing better than I am. He fixed our air conditioning for free. I think I might sign up for the air conditioning class myself. A 20-unit apartment building burned for about an hour before firemen were able to extinguish it. The fire started in the attic at about 10.30 p.m. yesterday evening. The damage was estimated at $1.5 million. A fire department spokesman said the fire might have been set deliberately. The tenants who first saw the blaze banged loudly on the door of every unit in the building. Occupants of 15 units were already in bed or preparing for bed. 
No one responded in the other five units because the tenants were not home. Those tenants who were home escaped with nothing more than the clothes on their backs, their pets, their cell phones, and their laptops. Many tenants went across the street to watch the fire from a safe distance. They were all hoping that their units would be spared. Some of the pets were so disturbed by the noise, crowds, flames, and smoke that their owners could not hold on to them. They clawed their way out of their owner's arms and dashed away. The younger children were similarly frightened. They cried in their parents' arms. Two fire engines arrived at 10.45 p.m., but the entire roof was ablaze by then. Smoke and flames were visible in most of the units on the top floor. At about 11.35 p.m., the flames were extinguished. Most of the roof had disappeared. The top floor of the two-story building was about 80% gone. Water was seeping into the ground floor units, ruining most of them. The tenants were crying or speechless. They were happy to be alive, but now they had no home. Where were they going to live? Firemen discovered a charred gasoline can in the attic. This was the second suspicious apartment fire in a month. A middle-aged man with a long beard was arrested by the police for disorderly conduct and property damage. More charges might be added later, said a police officer. The man, identified as Bill Wilde, checked into the Motel 5 last night, about an hour after sunset. Telling the clerk that he would be staying four nights, he paid cash in advance. He then asked her where a grocery store was. She said that the nearest grocery store was John John's, which was only two blocks away. The police said that Wilde went to John John's and purchased three gallons of honey and four gallons of chocolate syrup. The checker asked him what the occasion was. He replied, I'm trying to become a sweeter person. The checker smiled at the joke. Wilde drove back to the motel. He opened all seven containers and poured them into the bathtub. He added warm water to the mix. Then he placed his boombox on the bathroom floor next to the tub. He tuned the radio to an opera station. He got undressed, hopped into the tub, and started singing loudly with the music. Fifteen minutes later, the lodgers in the room next door phoned the clerk. She banged on Wilde's door, but he kept singing. She phoned his room, but he didn't answer. Then she called the police, who arrived quickly. Well, at least he paid in advance, said the clerk. That money will help pay for the plumber. The bathtub drain was completely clogged. The tub remained full of chocolate and honey. You just never know about people, said the clerk. He seemed so nice and friendly. Who'd have thought he was a bathtub singing nut? The police said this was the third time that Wilde had been arrested for this kind of behavior. The local university blood center had a blood drive today at the Civic Center Auditorium. Almost 300 people showed up, but about 50 were turned away for various medical reasons. 50 others left because the lines were moving so slowly. The event concluded at 6 p.m., three hours after the scheduled close. It was a long day for everyone, administrators, nurses, and donors. But there were plenty of chairs and tables, and many people brought their own books, magazines, or newspapers. The first thing that donors had to do, of course, was fill out the donor registration and screening form. When they finished filling out the form, they waited until a nurse called them to her desk. The average adult body contains 8 to 12 pints of blood. Donors can give one pint at a time. It takes your body two to four weeks to replace this amount. Most donors filled up the pint bag within five to ten minutes. Before leaving, the donors received a sheet of instructions including do not lift any heavy objects for 12 hours, leave your pressure bandage on for two to three hours, do not smoke for at least 30 minutes, Avoid alcohol for the rest of the day. Do not do any strenuous activity for 24 hours. I wish I could hug and kiss all the volunteers that are here today, said Martha, the blood center donor recruiter. 
Many donors underestimate the importance of what they're doing. They think it is no big deal, but it is a big deal. Their blood is actually saving lives, helping other people to live. We cannot thank them enough for that, nor can the recipients. The Fernwood Library sponsored Fernwood's 42nd Art Fair this weekend. The three-day event was held as usual at Memorial Park. Almost 100 artists showed up each day. More than 1,000 locals and visitors strolled through the Shady Park daily as temperatures remained in the comfortable 70s all weekend. All kinds of art were on display and for sale. Prices range from a couple of dollars to a couple of thousand dollars. Oscar, a native of Peru, was selling his beautiful paintings of the mountain village of Ayacucho, where he lives most of the year. Every year I come to the United States to sell my paintings at about five different art shows. Then I return to my country. That is where I do all my paintings in our beautiful mountains. Peter is a photographer. He travels throughout the Southwest U.S. One of his favorite areas is Northeast Arizona. That's where Spider Rock is, he said, pointing to a beautiful color photograph of a towering sandstone spire about 800 feet high. This rock, according to Navajo Indian lore, was the home of Spider Woman, a goddess revered by the tribe. A Navajo woman was selling her own rug weavings at the fair. She was busy creating a rug while visitors watched. When asked how long it took, she replied that her creations usually took months. She said that Navajo tradition was to always weave a slight flaw into an article so as not to offend Spider Woman because only Spider Woman could create a perfect weave. The exhibit areas were located throughout the park. Artists' creations, including jewelry, ceramics, birdhouses, gourd art, furniture, pottery, handmade musical instruments, music CDs, and sculpture. Almost all the artists had their work displayed beneath shady canopies. This was another successful year for our art fair, said the head librarian. The artists sold enough of their work to encourage them to return next year, and the library raised almost $700 from sales of various items. We'll use this money to purchase a few more tables and chairs. Crime in the city of Clio hit a 30-year low last year. This is absolutely wonderful for our citizens, our businesses, and our visitors, said Police Chief Lewis Gates. Clio has a population of 28,000, but it has at least 30 gangs. The gangs make most of their money from dealing drugs and offering protection. They also commit violent crimes, such as murder, battery, and rape. There were 1,486 thefts last year. Most of the thefts involved cars. Thieves also robbed the people at gunpoint or pickpocketed them. They broke into houses and businesses at the alarming rate of two a day two years ago, but that rate was down to only one a day last year. That's a 50% decrease in one year, beamed Gates. I think the officers deserve a big pat on the back. Even better, maybe they'll get that 10% raise that they are all hoping for next fiscal year. Citing an example of how the police force has helped reduce crime, Gates talked about bicycle thefts. For years and years, kids were locking up their bikes at bike stands in front of schools, libraries, and malls. About 10% of the time, the kids would come out of the school or wherever and discover that their bike was no longer there. Someone had cut the lock and stolen their bike. We racked our brains trying to find a solution to this problem. Finally, at the beginning of last year, we hit upon it. We simply removed most of the bike stands. Then the bicycle theft rate came down quickly.